nice way to spend a Saturday evening. I appreciate you being present with me. So, after working in the industry for a while, or being a, a concept artist, you, each person you'll find your own kind of particular, particular niche, you know, and what, what works for you, what feels the best. And uh, over the years, I've found that um, out of the, the wide spectrum of skills that a concept artist can have in the different stages of production, I found that my favorite time is the initial sketch period, like towards the very beginning of the game, when they don't really, when the designers might not have a really precise idea of what the entire world looks like, and they count on the concept artist to guide that vision. And I find that it's been very helpful to guide a vision with, to when you really want to create a universe, to create like a wide variety of characters at the very beginning. That way, you give the designers a wide selection of shapes and sizes and different sort of silhouettes to focus on. And they can, you know, say you create 50 to 100 different thumbnails. I'll give those thumbnails to the designers, and that'll start fueling some of their ideas. You know, they'll see those silhouettes. They'll get design ideas. They'll be inspired. Tonight, I'm going to focus on really like the main, like the silhouettes and kind of what I go through and, and how, how I think that through. Um, we're going to be using a couple programs. I'm going to start off with some ZBrush for the, the shapes and the silhouettes. And this is, I'm kind of debuting this. I've actually never really created shapes and silhouettes for thumbnails with ZBrush ever before. But I think I can do it tonight because I played with it last week and I use it from other applications and I think it'll work really well for this one. So we're, uh, we're all learning together on this one. We're, we're partnering in the uh, experimentation. Uh, that's what a lot of this is about is trying out some new things because, you know, as long as your intentions are set, you know, there's, there's really no, no failure in it. And uh, we're going to take some of the shapes that I create in ZBrush and take it into Painter and then uh, add a little detail and take it into Photoshop. And uh, really, just kind of, I'm going to, I have a couple things kind of planned, but actually, no, really, I don't. We're just going to kind of wing it tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop talking and, and start drawing. OK, so we're in ZBrush right now. And uh, ZBrush is just a phenomenal program for experimentation. Like, I have never had any formal training in ZBrush whatsoever. Um, I've had a couple great uh, 3D artists at Massive Black that have showed me a, a couple keys, or I'll have a couple questions, and I'll go to them. And I've been lucky enough to them to give me some answers. But most everything I've found in this program has just been experimentation. And um, I'm grateful for that, because it's allowed me to explore some things that I probably wouldn't have done if I went more of a traditional route. And so a lot of it's just finding new tools, seeing what it does, playing with different shapes. And you know, eventually, you'll find something that's going to kind of connect with you. And it's such an open-ended program, and there's so many different applications. You know, it's designed as a 3D program, and I use it for nothing but a 2D illustration program right there. I mean, that's a little unorthodox off the bat, but I've found some really neat results in it. So the tool that I'm going to use uh, for the technical side, it's one I, this is, a, this is a tool I found, actually. Like, I started playing with this literally a week and a half ago. And uh, it's called the, the Deco Brush, is the tool that I'm going to use. And uh, ZBrush comes, um, the Deco Brush is, is dependent on like the alpha channel. And the, uh, the alpha channel comes with a bunch of uh, default settings, which are here, which are different shapes and stars. And they're based off like a black and white image. And so what I've gone ahead and done is I've created my own series of shapes and lines and things I kind of identify with. I'll kind of go through here. There's kind of a funky hand symbol, an arrow with a circle, a calligraphy S. Uh, there's something I've been using a lot of fonts lately. I found that some, some fonts have just like kind of like a perfect rhythm to them. So there's the, the S there. Um, got a little O, got another little hand, got an got a eye of raw, got a little figure, got, a, got an om. You guys are so great for indulging me on stuff like that. I really appreciate it. Uh, another S and another little funny shape that I thought might be cool. 
So I'm going to start with one of the S's because it's a really nice, simple, basic shape. And um, I've got my canvas here. My canvas is going to be basically kind of like the screen resolution, like 1400 by 900. And uh, I'm just going to kind of clear my head a little bit and just start making some shapes. And my intentions are, I'm going to set my intentions now. It's very important to set your intentions are really important super important. Every morning when I wake up, one of the first things I do is like set my intentions for the day. What am I choosing? What, did, what, what do I want my day to look like? Do I want to choose to be especially creative today? Do I want to connect with my fellow human being today? Do I want to inspire people today? You know, do I just want to be myself today? Like follow this right through with art, you know, and your concept drawing. So my intentions are going to be to create some really dynamic and interesting shapes. And that's it. You know, they can turn into monsters, they can turn into robots, spaceships, whatever. Right now, my only intentions are to create interesting shapes. And by setting out intentions of that sort of limitation, it's not really limitation, but it, it gives you a framework to work within. It's pretty hard to, to fail. Their interesting shapes are pretty easy to do. So I'll show you a little bit how this brush sort of functions. I'm going to set it to black. And you can see, I'm just going to make some sound effects. OK, no more sound effects. Boom. So this is going to guide the majority of the demo right here, just these simple shapes I've made. And you can see it all started with an S, but the more you move it and twist it, and I think that's what really, that's what really attracts me to ZBrush in a way, because it's totally chaotic. Like I couldn't, I couldn't if, you, if you asked me to reproduce any of these shapes, absolutely impossible. I couldn't do it again. They're totally unique. Totally, totally, they're each to their own shape, and that's, something I really appreciate. We went, we, I talked about a little yesterday about how imagination works or how my particular imagination works and how I don't really rely on any sort of images in my head to create. I really, I go, just kind of go with whatever flow is going on. And so this really adds to that by just totally coming from this chaotic point, something I can build upon. So, and there's something just really viscerally fun about ZBrush that just gives you something that's so totally unpredictable. Because the problem with predictability is that it's really easy to fall into cliches if, if you can already predict what you're doing. So if I put myself in a vulnerable, or if I surrender to a plate of not being able to predict what I'm going to do, I'm always going to probably surprise myself in the end, which is always a lot more fun. So there's the S1. And for an initial state, I'm, I'm intentionally choosing a really organic shape to start off with. You know, before I got into ZBrush or before I got into Painter, you know, I started off with like pencil sketches and it was kind of the same way. A lot of times I'd maybe like put myself in like a real kind of like dark vacuum space. That's actually something I do sometimes because my mind is kind of like this dark sort of a vacuum when I close my eyes. I find that if I put myself in a state um, at a, when I was working over at Nintendo, my office was great. It had no windows and it had a big door that would lock and a couch and I would just lie back on this couch and close the room and be in like total darkness, like totally submerged. So I do that and sometimes I just lay with a big pad of like newsprint and a Prismacolor pencils and I just feel out some strokes, just put them down and then I turn the lights on and see what I got and it's like it's a total surprise. I think I like surprising myself maybe to a certain extent and maybe that's, that's why, why I do it like this. But anyway, so I start off with these organic shapes because, and I'm, also using this S-curve because there's something about just the S-curve in general that's repeated through anything organic and anything alive always has this rhythm and this S. So intrinsically by using the letter S, by creating this, I'm guaranteed really fluid, organic type of shapes. I'm sure as some of you even look at these shapes, you know, your mind might just be scrambling to make sense out of it. You know, you look at these and like, oh, that could be maybe a tail of a squirrel. I don't know. Or this could be... I don't even know what these things are, but maybe you guys might have an idea so far, but we're not there yet. We're going to be there in a little bit. So I've got all the organic shapes down. 
Now I'm going to choose something that has some more harder edges, and like this arrow one. One of the reasons I'm doing this in ZBrush right now is that I've been doing a similar technique like this for a while. I've been doing it in Painter, and it's gotten to the point where even my strokes in Painter, because uh, the only thing, the only variables in Painter I had while doing this with any sort of the brushes was like the thickness or thinness of the line. And I think after a while, I actually was beginning to get a bit repetitive, and I think that I was to a point where it was it was almost too it was I was getting to the point of like predictability and one of the things that tracked me to ZBrush is just how 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 foreign it was and is. I'm totally not super comfortable with this program at all. But that's what I kinda like about it because it really challenges me to learn new things and kind of break out of old habits. And as I'm making these lines, I'm now I'm looking at all of them all together and I'm just I'm concentrating on variation too because I want all of these to be very very different but at the same time still probably fit within the same sort of a universe this is the hand you can see it like that that's the way it really looks and this one's just it's just hard for me not to want to play with this one because it's really fun. See, it's like it's it's like it's almost alive. Isn't that neat? Isn't that kind of cool, Leo? Uh, You know, let me just stress how important it is to enjoy what you do, really. Like, if you're not enjoying what you do, it's, it's, you have no one to blame but yourself, you know, and it's totally, you can make, you can make almost anything fun if you really go for it, you know, as long as you do it, like, yeah, it's really important to enjoy what you're doing. It's all state of mind. Now I'm going to actually just bring in uh, some more geometrical shapes and I'm going to switch over to the, uh, some of the default geometry. And just since I'm starting off really simple, just like a simple cube. And the reason I chose a cube, and if you might notice, uh, between the shapes I'm using, I'm trying to go back and forth between a soft edge shape, like an organic shape, and a hard shape, just for that, just for that element of contrast. Most, most really successful designs you'll see will have a great degree of contrast to it, whether it's a contrast of hard and a soft shape, or it's a contrast in value, or it's a contrast in line. Contrast, our eyes are just immediately attracted to contrast, because without contrast, you have pretty much monotony, and that's not a lot of fun. Uh, another thing that's coming to mind, too, as I'm making these shapes, I'm trying to focus on, I am focusing on creating these shapes as probably as asymmetrical as possible. And uh, later on in the demo, you'll see why as asymmetry will really serve the needs I have. OK, so I'm looking at my shapes. And uh, I feel pretty comfortable where they're all at right now. They're definitely as complicated as I need them to be at this p point in time. and. Uh, now I'm just going to add, they're all obviously just black silhouettes right now. I'm going to change to kind of a, kind of a darker gray. And uh, I'm going to add a little bit of some gray shapes on top of these just to give it like one more kind of layer of depth. the one challenge that I'm faced with right now is trying not to imagine what these things are going to look like. Because if I start imagining what they're going to look like, then I'm going to build up these expectations. 
And if I build too many expectations, the most likely I'm going to be disappointed with myself because I can expect some pretty amazing things. And so if I try not to have any expectations, then I'm never disappointed. You know, just like this demo. If you guys expect this to be an awesome demo, like, I'm sorry, it's going to probably really suck. But if you have, like, no expectations of me and realize me for, like, you know, like the imposter and the fraud I am, then we're all good. We're having a good time Saturday night. So you can see just with these three value ranges already kind of an I kind of an illusion of depth that's kind of being suggested. So they're still really simple silhouettes, but they have a little bit of like form form and shape going on with them too. So I feel pretty comfortable with that right now. I'm going to select the sphere tool and I'm gonna change my color to red. And in ZBrush, you have this materials option here, and you can choose way too many different types of surface textures than you'll ever need in your entire life. I usually use like one, two, or three of them up here. And I'm going to choose this one, because I like it. And without even really thinking too much about it, I'm just going to add some little red balls of focal point contrast. As I added those little red balls, all these different shapes began to develop a little bit more personality to me now. So I'm going back to my little S tool and I'm gonna add a little bit more outside detail, but not so much that they become super objective. Just enough to give it some more character. Now I'm going to, I'm going to the document setting, I'm going to go hit export, and export, exports my screen to uh, just like a flat single image. And while we're at it, and I think we do have some time to kill, because I don't know if there's any speakers that are speaking after me, I'm just going to make, uh, it took me a while to do that while I was talking at the same time. Usually when I'm doing it off the cuff, it'll take me like a few minutes. So I'm just gonna do another like really quick page of those even faster because I'm afraid I might've been even thinking a little bit too much like that. Speed slows the mind. You know, like I wasn't it's really easy not even to think about that. You know, like no judgment, no anything, just like purely visceral. How can I fail? I'm making just chaos and nothing. You know, it's like total freedom, real freedom to create in this sort of a manner. I highly, highly recommend it. And I'm gonna open up my favorite painting program on the planet, Corel Painter. So here are all my shapes. And as if they weren't complicated enough already, which they're actually really complicated, I'm going to make them even a little bit more complicated too. And I'm going to do that by using the, uh, some paper textures. And uh, I'll give a quick rundown on how a paper texture works. 
basically a paper texture is made by any image, any, any black and white, high contrast sort of image you have, you can take that. Actually, I could, theoretically, I'll, and I will, I'll make this into a paper texture. I could take this right here, this selection, select this. I just capture that selection. Made it a paper texture. You can see I can paint exactly what I captured. And the paper texture, you can also change the size. And you can also invert your selection. So I think that, that alone kind of just gives you a little bit of taste of what the, the paper, Corel's paper painter engine is capable of. You can see here in this box right here, these are all of my pre-made paper textures, you know, and they, they're all over the place. This one right here, let's see, uh, some of them I actually name. Android master stencils. These are all the airbrushing stencils I use. I threw them out on the ground and took a picture of them. Makes some really cool shapes. This one's a bunch of gaskets that I had and that I, a bunch of pictures I found on the internet and put those together. And they just kind of go on and on. Circuit board, microphotography, veins, Chinese papers, stencils, just, I mean, really whatever, whenever I, I'm doing any sort of like Google searches, I'm on the internet or just in my daily kind of like walk around, if I see something that like really catches my eye, like that's a cool shape that really catches my eye, then sometimes I'll take a picture of it or sometimes I'll save it. And I'm kind of always on the hunt for stencils. Actually, yeah, paper stencils, airbrush stencils, you know, one's man's trash is my art, you know. So it's a, it's a neat, it makes, it makes my walk to work a lot more exciting a lot of the times. So with these textures. And you can also pull down the menu and see all the papers here. But what I've done, I like making this little custom button that so I can just go back and forth between papers really freely. So I'm going to select the uh, Android master stencils. Because see this one here, this has a lot of like really neat kind of technical shapes to it. I'm going to size it down a bit. I'm just going to go around and kind of, you know, even though I'm kind of adding more to the silhouettes, I can also use these to simplify areas, simplify areas that might be a little bit too busy. I'm going to go with my gaskets. Gaskets are really Gaskets are just a neat, neat, neat shape. And again, it's really the unpredictability that I'm going for here because I really have no idea which I'm, I'm familiar with this image of gaskets because I created it, but as I lay the chalk tool down, I have no idea where it's going to reference or what the starting and ending point is going to be. So right now, all of these, there's a little bit of value, but the majority of them are really still pretty flat in general. So I'm feeling like adding, adding a little bit of depth onto these. So I'm going to take this tool. This is a Just Add, Just Add Water. Actually, let me, let me just touch briefly on the tools that I have out here. I stretch to use 10 different categories. And I put all those 10 right there. I use the colored pencil tool. I use the chalk tool. I use the palette knife. I use the airbrush. I use the Just Add Water. I use Glow. I kind of use this one. It's kind of a squirrely one. It's fun for gestures. Um, I use the uh, pattern chalk, uh, I sometimes use the pastel, I use the eraser, here's a variation on the loaded palette knife, and you guys aren't allowed to know what that brush is yet. Sorry. 
Okay, and out of these 10 brushes, I'm gonna choose the Just Add Water. Just Add Water is an incredible tool. It's kind of like the smudge brush in Photoshop, only it really works well. And it never, it never, it never slows up. It doesn't take a lot of processing power. It's really fast and really responsive. And um, I'm gonna put it at a pretty low opacity. Maybe something like 10. And I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna start, you can see my cursor here. I'm gonna start from the white and I'm gonna move in on my shape. And you can see as I'm doing this, not only is it knocking the value back, it's also giving the illusion that there's some atmosphere that's being created. And at the same time, it's softening the edges. That's one thing too. All the edges I have right now, these are all really hard e edges. Really hard, really sharp edges, and that's intentional. And so with something like the Just Add Water tool, by softening these edges, I'm creating more of that contrast. I'm layering the contrast on itself and creating some more depth in these. It's also a nice way to settle down some of the complexities when some of the areas are a little bit almost too busy, like my eye doesn't really know what to focus on. And so it's a nice way of taking a lot of separate shapes and unifying them together. Now that I've softened some edges and added a little atmosphere, I'm, I'm getting a feeling of kind of some more, some more depth now. I'm gonna take, this is a, a 2B pencil and um, I, I set it to cover, so basically it's just, it's just like a, any sort of like round mark making tool that covers what you put on, on top of it. I never like using anything at 100% opacity, and so I'm gonna set it to about maybe, maybe 80. And uh, you see this is a feature only available in Painter where you can rotate the canvas, which is just really great to, really helps me get the strokes that I want to get. I mean, my hand kind of naturally has a stroke that's going to feel more comfortable based on the muscles in my arm and my bones and the way that my wrist bends. And so this helps me really kind of hit that, hit that mark that I want with a lot more accuracy. So I'm going through here and I'm refining the overall silhouette. And at this stage, I am going to start thinking a little bit about where I want these shapes to go or if I see any sort of function in the shapes or if their personalities start giving me an idea of what I can what these shapes will serve and what I can use them for. But actually, right now, I'm just making sure these things all look kind of cool. I'm switching back and forth between white and black, the positive and the negative space. And I'm also thinking about any way that I can still increase the variation between all of these shapes. Now I'm selecting the the glow brush, and I'm setting my color down to a pretty dark gray, and I'm going to go through and just add some highlights on these shapes. I'm not giving too much thought to any sort of complicated lighting scenario, just some sort of maybe overhead light, and these highlights will help define some of the form and show me what areas would be the farthest towards me, also help define some of the edges. So at this point, I'm going to start making a couple decisions. Uh, a lot of these are, are definitely feeling pretty kind of alien, robotic-ish sort of sort of a feeling. So 
I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kind of go with that. Figure this is some sort of future off-world alien robot type of technology, and that's the world I'm gonna be operating in. And these are the type of characters that are gonna inhabit it. Hmm. Right now I'm gonna go over another important aspect of Painter, and that is the the patterns tool. So the pattern tool really potent and powerful tool. Uh, I start off by creating an image for this one. Um, I created a simple shape and I just repeated it and paid, paid special attention to make sure that it would tessellate naturally. So where this one ends, this one starts. Really simple. You capture it the same way you do the painter. Select all, go over the patterns, capture pattern. Be done. Then you're going to select, I like using, out of the variations of this one, the only one I use is, is pattern chalk, which is important because all the others are really different. So select pattern chalk, go to my pattern, select the color, what it's doing it's got yeah. pressure sensitivity to it okay. and what makes this kind of what I like about this is that the shapes you make really it deforms them and aligns them together even when you rotate it and it works on any sort of simple shape whatsoever so some of the preloaded ones I have I have one that I made for like a vertebrae and a spine that I was using the other day. It's really great for tentacles. It's really great for anything that's really repetitive, re repetitive and that you wouldn't have the patience or inclination to draw. It's a great tool to use for that. Okay, I'm taking, I'm back to the glow tool. And these red little spheres that I created at the beginning are now going to start becoming little glowing red eyeballs. Why not? I'm gonna select the second set that I did and just do the same thing, only much faster. I'm doing this just because I want to give you guys a feel for the pace that I would really kind of normally work if I didn't have to narrate all my steps. Yeah, you know, if it was like spaceships, I definitely would kind of focus on, you know, in the back of my head might have been like cockpit and thrusters or wings. So, yeah, they definitely, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, I don't know, kind of like a blender, you know, like I'll go into it with certain ideas of, of what I want, whatever I know that I want to take out of it. I'll start off with those sort of intentions and I'm drawing it, but like for this example, yeah, it was really just no intent like kind of really just 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 neat shapes and those neat shapes will just kind of start turning into something after a while
I, I, I stop once it stops becoming fun or interesting. You know, I just kind of move on to something else. But actually, I, there's something I really enjoy about this phase because it's definitely the phase of the most freedom. Because once you get past this stage, then you get into like refinement. Then you get into like orthographics and like, oh my gosh, I I could make a probably 500 thumbnails in the time it takes me to do like one really solid orthographic, and so I'd much I'd much rather spend my time doing this. Fine, the silhouette, you know, like right here. Here's a good example. You just have kind of like a flat flat shape. As I refine the silhouette, I can also start using the contour to add form and dimension to it. So now that black shape is coming out of space and like back into space again. dodge tool just to kind of clean up any gray around some of these shapes. kind of neutral enough that they could be different functions like you know for example this one let's see I want to make a bigger cursor this one here it could be it's so fluid that it could be a race car or it could be a gun you know some of these could definitely be a lot of these could be ships or characters in general which is kind of neat it's nice to be in a state where you have that much flexibility so in about an hour, we've got 18 different kind of shapes and silhouettes. There's still a bit more room to define these. Um, the next step that I do after this is since I still haven't committed to any of these yet, I've been really specific about not getting to individually to marry to any single one of these, I, I could, and I can choose a single a couple out, like maybe this one right here is already feeling like something, I could put that aside. Uh, the next step that I do to kind of keep this fun is uh, create a new layer, and I'm going to set that layer, I'm going to set it to darken, and I'm going to select transform, the horizontal, And there you go. We're already starting to get, just on that initial flip, I can already see a couple different characters come out of that. And from there, this is where the fun starts. So this is kind of like a, a hunter and gathering stage of the process. And whenever I see a shape that I like enough, I'm going to do, a, since it's two different layers and I want the layers to be independent, I'm going to do a copy shift merge on these to get the full image. Actually, what I'm going to do is create a new canvas that I can just drop all these in once I find them. That'll serve me. And it'll serve you too. Most, if your selected destination for this sort of application is going to be a video game, uh, one of the most important things about developing with the silhouette is the silhouette is what you see from a distance. You know, any character you design, it can look really great up close with all like the normal maps and the detail, but they really need to read from afar. Japan would always emphasize like whatever characters you design really have to read 
from a distance because that's when you're first going to encounter them. And just from like a recognition of shapes level and gameplay design, it helps to have a character you can recognize from a distance and close up. And so by zooming out at this sort of distance, I'm a definitely able to kind of get that feel and that sort of effect. your eyes where you've, you've seen so much and you've seen so much of the same thing over and over again that you sometimes there's kind of an intuitiveness that develops that when you see something new that your eyes is really is drawn to that much faster than something that'd be more predictable okay so so far almost every one of the shapes I've selected so far have been symmetrical you know so it's, it's easy to kind of identify and get that feeling if you were to approach this enemy kind of straight on, what it looked like. And now by taking one of the layers and changing its axis, thank you. All right. I'm here to freak your mind out. That's, that's what I can't, that's why I woke up this morning. That was my intention. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna wake up. I'm gonna smoke this cigarette. I'm gonna drink this Red Bull. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna freak some dude's mind out. <laughs> See, it's the power of thought, power of your imagination, instantly manifested. Boom. There's my intention. It works today. Prove it. I'm gonna do it tomorrow too. I know it's gonna work. That's the secret. <laughs> yeah. So I mean it. It's about, I've been doing this for an hour and a half so far, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I hope you guys can see just, kind of see like the raw potential of this sort of method. You know, just as I move it around, I'm sure you guys are seeing things that I'm not seeing, and I might be seeing things that I don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, the fun part of this, at, at this stage, what's kind of fun is just, kind of trusting your kind of counter, or just kind of trust your intuitiveness. And you know, the shape doesn't have to be like totally clearly, it doesn't have to be spelled out for you. I have used this same technique actually for figures. And So I'm just going to take this right here as like a template for the figure. Like, I wouldn't see a lot of point in using this technique to get like really accurate proportions down or anything. You know, like say that your character, say if one of the things was to create like a character that was kind of in this, in this sort of a world, um, you know, it'd just be a, a gamble if you had like arms and legs that would match up to like the exact like ratios of the human proportion. But one thing that I've done in the past is I've taken this, say this sort of a template, and I look through here, and instead of looking for the whole thing to just be like instantly delivered to you immediately, um, you could go through, oops, and you could find pieces. So you see like this might be like a good like piece for some sort of shoulder pad equipment. this piece could make a pretty intimidating sort of like feathered headdress, you know? And uh, you can go on and on. One of the things I have used this for characters and what I would do is instead of looking for like an overall shape for a figure, I'd go into it and I'd just find chest plates, breast plates, face masks, helmets, armbands, leg bands, weapons, straps, and I'll make an entire sheet just like this 
just of the individual pieces. You know, I have like 20 different torsos and 20 different what could be a leg or what could be an arm. And I just take this template and just drop, drop, drop over and over. And I'll make it all interchangeable too. So I can have this Photoshop layer where you have 20 different helmets you can go back and forth or 20 different chest pieces. In reality, um, drawing is really it's the manifestation of your thoughts, you know? So the more thoughts you have and the more intentions behind that, the more that you're going to get out of that, out of that in the end. And as much as I love your company, we don't want to watch Andrew rendering out 50 little creatures all night. Let's do it. All the way. We're going all the way, guys. Rendering out every one of these. No. So this is, uh, so this works pretty good. For, for you know, little small enemy characters, and obviously, want to go down that rabbit hole. We just do it all over again. <laughs> no, literally, we could be here all night if I kept I kept doing this. No, no not really. Oh. Yeah, I think I ask myself that question a lot of the times, like, why do you do this? You know, why, why, do I, why do I draw monsters? And, you know, like, I think this better question is, why are you guys here? <laughs> why are you guys here watching me draw monsters? But, you know, the, the question answers itself almost in a way. It's like, if I have to ask myself, like, why I'm here, it's like, look at this. I'm here. And here are all you guys here to see me. Like this is really, in, in a in a really honest way, this is like major validation for something. And I really appreciate you guys being here. And I really appreciate you guys appreciating what I appreciate. Thank you very much. You guys, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you.